So once more, this session is being run by Stuart Farmer, who is the Education Manager for the Institute of Physics in Scotland. He's going to be talking today about the physics of climate change. Now, last week when Stuart ran his session on diagnostic questions, one of the delegates fed back saying it was the best professional learning experience they'd ever had. So, no pressure this afternoon then, Stuart. Uh, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gregor. So this might be the, the second best um, experience that anybody's had this afternoon, but uh, he, here's hoping. Um, right, well, welcome to this, uh, the third of the virtual summer school sessions. And uh, this one is on the physics of climate change. And as you can see from the, the slide, it's based on materials from the Perimeter Institute in Canada. Uh, the, the Perimeter Institute is the basically the world's leading independent theoretical physics uh, research institute. And uh, as part of its mission, uh, it's been was set up about uh, 20 years ago now by Mike Lazaridis, who was the founder of Research in Motion, the company behind the, the BlackBerry mobile phone. And uh, he realized that he had made his wealth and his success on the back of Blue Skies research from uh, sort of many years, decades before. And um, in order to continue that legacy, he founded the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in his hometown in Waterloo, which is about an hour's drive west of Toronto in Canada. And the Institute of Physics in Scotland had a, a good working relationship with the Perimeter Institute now for about uh, six years or so. And uh, we have uh, presented a number of workshops on some of their outreach materials because um, right from the outside, uh, outset, Mike Lazaridis, uh, when he founded the organization, not only wanted the organization to produce world leading theoretical physics research, but actually to have outreach activities to the public and to education. Uh, and as a result, they have uh, developed a whole range of um, educational support materials, um, which uh, are now freely available to download from the web. So um, we will be basing today's session on a couple of the, the, the resources, mainly the um, one which is on climate change as a grade 10 for the Ontario curriculum. Um, they got funding actually from the Ontario um, the uh, provincial government to uh, fund these resources. Um, uh, but there's also another one, uh, Temperature Rising, which is uh, for the Ontario Grade 7. So, you know, broadly uh, equivalent to, you know, upper primary, lower secondary. Um, and they, they contain a range of activities, uh, you know, suitable for BGE and in some cases uh, into like National 4 and National 5 as well. Uh, so that, that's going to be the, the sort of background resources. Um, they are freely available, as I said before, and I, I am being joined again today by Alan Reid, the, the IOP Scotland physics coach up in Murray, um, and he's going to be monitoring the chat. He's also going to be posting a number of uh, web links uh, there to various resources as we go along um, and um, you know, raising questions and we'll be chipping in um, uh, as we go through the session, uh, because um, I've delivered this session uh, a number of times now, not not actually very often in Scotland. Uh, you know, I have actually delivered this session in Canada and Wales and England, you know, more often than I have in Scotland. Uh, but Alan has also uh, delivered this session, and particularly with uh, primary teachers, something that I haven't done. So he's got insights and uh, knowledge about this topic that he will be uh, inputting into the, the, the session as we go along as well, uh, as well as uh, monitoring your, your chat and uh, raising any questions and things uh, as we go along. And I, I saw that, uh, I think it was James uh, has already raised a question. So that actually leads quite uh, naturally and neatly on to the first slide. Um, and that is that we are going to ask you what questions you have about teaching climate change. Um, it's obviously a, a hot topic, if you excuse the pun, um, and something that many of our um, 
pupils are concerned about uh, something that we as a, you know, the human race have to uh, grapple with. So there are some questions and I would like you to use the, the chat box uh, to add in your questions and uh, I'll give you a, a couple of minutes to do that and then ask Alan to uh, uh, just to, to summarize uh, some of these things and then we'll do the session and hopefully as part of the session we'll be able to address the questions that you have about the topic. So I'll be quiet for a couple of minutes and let you uh, have a little think about what are the sorts of issues that concern you about teaching about climate change. Thanks Eileen, I know Stuart said he was going to be quiet there. I'm just going to quickly mention that um, I'm going to post a number of links throughout the course of the session here, but they'll all be shared afterwards. So please don't feel you have to try and copy them in real time. Uh, please feel free to ignore my presidential tweet stream until afterwards. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. I see that we've still got uh, a few people typing, so I'll maybe just give this uh, a few more seconds and then we'll uh, start to just summarise some of the, the main themes that are coming through. And hopefully, um, I, I'm, from what I'm seeing so far, I know that we can certainly hopefully address some of them during the session this afternoon. Okay, Alan, do you think we can uh, summarise what we're getting into a number of key key ideas and themes? 
Um, I certainly see that you know, Eileen was, uh, I think, first off the mark with the, the whole issue about um, teaching issues without raising pupil anxiety. Which, uh... Yes, I see we've gone straight in there with one of the hardest questions, haven't we? I mean, there are some of the science questions, a lot of which I know you're going to address this afternoon, but uh, certainly that one about anxiety, I've fallen foul of myself. I've taught this whole um, you know, I work based around this presentation to a first year UPS class and came away patting myself on the back about what a fantastic job I'd done about it. And then the next week we got a telephone call to guidance from a parent of one of the children who was refusing to get out of bed and didn't see any point in coming to school anymore. So it's definitely uh, definitely something that has to be handled with people obviously more sensitivity than I. Yes, I think that one of the, the key things, and it will be something that come back to at the end, is is um, showing that there is hope and that uh, there are things that we can do. Uh, there might well be difficult things. I can see that other people in the chat, you know, have talked about, um, um, you know, reversing climate change without um, changing lifestyles and so on. There will be hard decisions that need to be made, I think. Um, and uh, I can see that there are, you know, a number of, you know, questions around about um, issues about, you know, do the scientists really know? I think it was one that Yvonne has said, well, hopefully we'll give you some um, evidence that um, scientists do know quite a lot. I think that that's one of the problems with the, the way that the media reacts to this topic, that there is still this um, inbuilt media reaction that uh, things have got to be balanced. And, you know, I know in the past that the, the BBC has have wheeled on people like um, um, the um, uh, Nigel Lawson, you know, the former Chancellor of the Exchequer to, you know, be a, a balance against um, some, you know, well-recognised scientists, um, which I think is completely distorts the actual real balance that there is. Uh, and I know that that's something, Alan, that you've been doing a little bit of uh, investigation into, just around the sort of consensus and um, the the whole issue around about, um, you know, even conspiracy theories and things like that associated with the topic. Yeah, well, that issue of um, trying to present a, in, in quotes, balanced argument in the press seems to happen more in the UK, France and the United States than it does in most other countries. Um, but the, the BBC and other uh, mainstream media organisations in the UK have finally taken the decision recently that they do not feel they any longer have to present a balanced and in inverted commas argument. Um, the, this scientific consensus is pretty clear and it's something that students will ask you know well you know i've heard that such and such some of the scientists don't agree and that's true some of the, a very small number don't but you will find a very small number of scientists that don't agree with any scientific theory you want to come up with but since 2007 when the american association of petroleum geologists and you can probably guess which side their bread is buttered on uh, released a revised statement that there, there is really no um scientific body of national or international standing that is trying to uh, reject you know, the findings of human-induced effects on climate change. The, um, the, it's, it's, the, the problem with the whole issue is it's become politicised in the press, so it's hard to talk about it without sounding like you're politicising it. Um, and we are now beset with conspiracy theory. Pay, play five-a-side football with a primary school teacher who is convinced that the whole thing is a hoax made up by the tech companies, by Apple and Google, in order to uh, better track our movements, etc., um, and unfortunately, as the world becomes a scarier and more confusing place, the reason conspiracy theories do better and better is because they allow people to impose some sort of order and understanding on a confusing and complicated world. And their, um, you know, personality types have some role to play in this. But the main thing which makes people susceptible to conspiracy theories is ignorance. Unfortunately, once people are, have become um, tuned into conspiracy theory, they will ignore evidence to the contrary or um, actively spin it in a way that supports their theory. So, so those people are probably lost, but what we can do is inoculate people against conspiracy theories um, by providing them with information. And as Stuart's going to, providing them with some understanding of what science is and why it is we should believe the scientist rather than the shouty politician who is presenting an alternative. And almost as if that was planned, I think that that gives us a, a good position to, to move on um, because what I would like to do now 
um, is to look at what the evidence actually is. Uh, and here is a, a graph that um, uh, looks at the, the, the temperature um, of the Earth. Um, again, we'll be looking at uh, this more precisely uh, as we go through the, the session, but uh, I think that the evidence that the Earth is warming um, is um, very much um, incontroversial. Um, one of the whole issues around this whole topic, and again, it's one of the things that you'll hear people um, raise, is the whole issue about um, cycles and whether there are natural cycles, you know, to do with the the um, uh, the sun or, you know, the, the relative motion of the uh, earth and the sun and so on, and that, or, or geological cycles, volcanoes, things like that, that there are these natural cycles and that all that we're actually experiencing is a situation where there is warming due to these uh, natural cycles. And one of the things that is really important to, I think, to explore with the kids is that whole issue and about how you actually present the data because it's very easy by selectively choosing the baseline from which you measure and the data that you present to actually tell a slightly different story. And that's a lot of the, the climate change deniers. Essentially, that's what they do. When they, they take the evidence, they're very careful about which um, data they use and how they present it. Um, so this whole idea of where do you take the baseline from your measurements, where What's your comparator? So here's a typical graph that is on screen at the moment, and you can see that the, the baseline is essentially taken um, of a, an average over a, a significant number of years in the, the sort of mid to late part of the 19th century. But what we've now got is a, a graph that shows from the beginning of the 20th century up to uh, you know close to the present date that we have got a, a, a gradual increase in trend. Now. Uh, as I said earlier, um, Alan will be posting a, a number of um, links in the chat box, um, and these include a number of websites that you can get this data from. Um, again, links are also uh, presented in the Perimeter Institute packs that you can download. Um, and one of the websites that you can get data from, you can actually home in on um, geographical cells uh, across the world and look at what the data is for that area. So this is the one from central Scotland. That I, uh, I think if I remember off the top of my head, Scotland's covered by about four or five cells uh, from the, the size that they, they choose. And um, there's the, the, the data again, you know, over um, this sort of fairly standard um, sort of period through from the, the sort of 19th through the 20th century up to present day. And, and Scotland is, uh, getting warmer. Um, it's actually not necessarily getting uh, as warm as other parts of the, the world. Um, and again, there are whole issues and discussions that we can have about the sorts of changes that are taking place in the North Atlantic that um, actually affect us being a, an island relatively stuck out in the, the middle of the ocean. So um, Scotland's getting warmer and um, we therefore can look at the um, sort of current trends and then make predictions about um, how that's going to change in the future. And I noticed that in the chat box, there was um, uh, some uh, questions about, um, you know, what do we have to do? Uh, and is it just, you know, stopping the trend where we are? Or, um, you know, will there be a, a change which will peak at some point? Um, and essentially the, the models that um, uh, have been developed are, are you know, quite uh, sophisticated and they um, are based on this um, um, RCP measure, the, the representative concentration pathway. And essentially the, the, these different lines um, are based on different assumptions about what will happen, uh, mainly to the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And uh, essentially the the lower ones, um, um, like the, the, the sort of purple line on that graph, um, is if we take extremely stringent measures, um, you know, certainly things that we're not doing and that there's no indication essentially that we will do the sorts of things that would be required to address that in order to essentially, um, you know, stabilize things. Um, the uh, next line up is essentially 
um, one where there would be um, a, a sort of peak carbon dioxide level around about the year 2040. Um, and then, you know, a, 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 so certainly um, a, a, a no further increase. Uh, and again, uh, the orange one a little bit further up from that, it's a peak around about 2080. So that, that would give, um, you know, the, the sort of range of um, values depending on what actions we take and what happens to the carbon dioxide level uh, going forward. And again, you know, you can look up websites which you can, um, you know, get the graphs. They're updated regularly, and um, and you can look at what the uh, actual values are for different geographical locations. Now, we are talking about um, relatively small temperature changes, um, you know, in the grand scale of things, going from you know absolute zero, um, but in actual fact. Biological systems are quite sensitive to um, small temperature changes, as I would hope that these two photographs would uh, highlight. And anyone who's had, you know, small children um, or you know even adults um, at, at this time will know that you know running a fever of a couple of degrees or so uh, can have quite a, a significant effect on uh, a human body. And essentially, there are aspects of the um, the, the the planetary environment that uh, can be affected uh, in a similar uh, in a similar way. Um, so the um, you know intergovernmental panel on climate change have had various agreements and you know various targets um, which you've probably heard about about uh, trying to limit the change uh, well very very stringent ones to one and a half degrees uh, others to two degrees and so on um, and uh, essentially um, you know changing much more than that is when we're likely to see uh, quite significant changes uh, going forward. Now, there are um, um, a few really good graphics, uh, so animations and other simulations that you can use. Um, now, I know from speaking to Gregor in the past, having um, since he's organized the, the blended learning courses for uh, CERC for a number of years, that trying to run video on events like this can cause problems for quite a number of, of people. So I've actually um, replaced the videos which I would normally embed into the PowerPoint with stills, just so that we don't um, have um, the um, problems with um, video causing bandwidth problems, etc. for you. Uh, and again, we'll make sure that all of these links um, to access the animations um, are sort of freely available after the event. Uh, I think both through CERC and we can post them up on uh, Talk Physics uh, as well. Um, and this is one of the standard animations where um, it starts off in 1850. Again, um, you know, a, a good you know baseline date um, in terms of a lot of the the measurements and um, you know so sort of early on in the Industrial Revolution, and then it plots for every month the actual temperature up to. Um, the, the the present day or, or close to the, the present day and um, as you can see that um, it actually starts off with the blue lines uh, when it starts in 1850 and spirals around and as time goes on it gradually um, spirals outwards um, and the, the color changes as well now I think this is um, uh, the use of graphics and animations like this um, have to be handled carefully. It's one of the things that uh, I think we alluded to before when when Alan discussed the topic that um, you know it's sometimes some of these graphics looking at the changes that can actually um, have quite an impact on on young children. I don't know if Alan, if you want to uh, say a little bit um, about your experience using graphics, both the the positive aspects that they can lend, but also uh, how they can possibly backfire a little bit with uh, some children. Well, yeah, exactly. I've, I've done this quite a bit with a sort of younger audience and there are some lovely, wonderful visualization, visualizations and animations. This one and the um, NASA map, which I think maybe we'll have a little bit of a, a look at later, or maybe that, that was posted as a kind of pre-event uh, thing to watch. I'll certainly post it up here. And yeah, ju just as you've said, I mean, it's, it's a lot more powerful seeing something like that than it is seeing all the data in a table or a graph. 
but at the same time they, they can be so powerful that they can they, they can um they, they can hurt and upset and certainly from the primary teachers i've worked with they uh, were very cautious uh, about how they were going to use some of these lovely visualizations okay th thanks so um the powerpoint that i'm actually using here does actually have a lot of these visualizations but they are um hidden at the moment so that uh, again if we make the the powerpoint available um then if you actually want to then use this in class uh, all you need to do is to hide the still slides um and unhide the ones with the embedded animations and um you can actually use them in class so you've got the option um but um i'm working on the basis yet and it seems to work that uh, we've um skipped past the the animation um so sea levels are rising one of the the impacts of climate change um, is the fact that, that sea levels are rising. And there we have got a, a measure for uh, change in millimetres. And you can see, again, going this time slightly different baseline, uh, 1880 up to close to the present day, uh, we've had an increase of um, getting on for 250 milli millimetres. So, um, you know, nearly 10 inches in old money, um, which, you know, you might think, you know, over uh, almost a century and a half, maybe um, isn't a, a huge amount. Um, but um, again, we have got good data, which actually indicates, you know, that that um, is a, a genuine um, increase. And part of the reason for that is that we now have uh, quite sophisticated uh, measuring um, devices where we're using radar to uh, from satellites to actually make these measurements. So obviously not the case in, in uh, 1880, but um, we have now got very sophisticated um, measuring devices. And, you know, as I said, a few centimeters uh, might not seem like much, but here's a, a couple of photographs that were taken on a, a coastal area somewhere in North America. Uh, and if you, you might not be able to see, but down in the bottom corner, um, the dates are, are 1999 and 2004, so only five years apart. Uh, but obviously, you can see that the um, erosion of the dunes there um, is quite significant. And I know, um, having been down the coast, and, you know, I live in Aberdeen, but uh, down uh, at Montrose, um, there is a sort of similar coastal er er erosion uh, to this uh, down there, where there's the, the golf course, etc., where there are, uh, you know, potentially quite serious. Uh, problems and um, you know further south in East Anglia and places that we have got um, that the sort of same sort of scale of erosion um, as you can see in in this photograph. So you know it doesn't actually take many um, centimeters change to start to impact on certain areas. And um, you know a few centimeters at high tide uh, can have some quite devastating effects. Um, so. That takes us on to uh, some activities, and I'm going to try and uh, do some demonstration activities this afternoon. Um, I, there are a number of sort of experimental practical activities that are built into the Perimeter Institute packs, um, and the, I, I would advocate that they're actually best done as class demonstrations anyway, rather than uh, all pupil hands-on experiments. Um, because it actually um, allows an opportunity to have good class and, and small group um, discussion. And they tend to use the predict, observe, explain, apply, apply or, or explain again uh, technique. It was one of the things that I talked about last week as part of the diagnostic question. So that um, what we have got um, are a number of activities that I'm going to, to introduce to you and show you and I'm going to ask you to make predictions, and then we're going to actually set them up in a practical sense, um, and then actually see what happens when we let them run for a few minutes, and then come back and see how that actually fits in. And, and again, this is one of the strategies where um, what you can do is actually show the pupils the actual effect um, of some very simple basic physics, which we'll explore as we go along. So um, the first one 
is to look and predict and explain what happens when ice heats up. And I'm going to ask Gregor at this point if he could actually um, switch off the slides if it's possible, just so that we can get a fuller screen view. Yeah, I'm now seeing that. So hopefully the rest of you are, are seeing um, that. So I've actually got one or two things you know, set up um, on shelves and things around about me. And um, we, I'm going to try and illustrate in front of you on the camera so you can get an idea of what I'm setting up. Um, the, the experiments. Now, they're all, as is the case with many of the Perimeter Institute uh, resources, based on very cheap everyday resources. So here I've got uh, the bottom of uh, a two liter, um, you know, fizzy water bottle or something like that. Um, and uh, I've got some water in it. But you can see that down the side, um, I have got just a little strip of masking tape. And that means if I put it back down on a, a flat surface, what I can do, just let it stabilize. Again, normally you would just do this on a, a bench with the, the class so that you, know, you wouldn't be moving it around and it would be stable, is what I can do is um, mark on the um, water level. I realized I haven't quite done things properly um, because I need to put the ice in first because we're going to be looking at melting ice. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to um, introduce the the second of the containers. And you can see it's basically identical with a bit of masking tape down the side. But you can see this time I've got some um, chunks of uh, Aberdeen granite in there. Um, so that what we've actually got are two models, one simulating um, ocean with just the water and the other one um, simulating a continent uh, which is surrounded by ocean. And what I've now got um, is I've been making ice uh, over the weekend in the ice box in my fridge. So I've got lots of ice cubes here. And what I'm going to do is just transfer the ice cubes into the two beakers, the two containers. So I've got ice on the top of the continent in one, and then I've got ice um, in the ocean in the other. So I'll just put this in. Now this, of course, I, I was a bit premature in marking on the, 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 the uh, masking tape with the, the level of the water because the, the level of the water has now risen since I've added in the ice. So I think we've got plenty in, in there. So just lifting back up again, you can see that we have now got uh, the continent which had water filled up to just below the top of the stones out of the garden. Uh, and then what I've done is just deposited some ice cubes. And that means that I can now, and this is where I do need my uh, marker pen, is I'll turn that around to mark on the masking tape and put uh, a mark on the masking tape where we have got the, the level of the water in the ocean surrounding the continent, which has got a glacier on top. And I'm just going to put that uh, up here. And then I'm going to do the same with the ocean. And here, um, you know, I've now got a mark which I'm going to ignore. And I'm now going to put on um, a mark in the right place, the upper of the two marks, because we have now got the um, water uh, in the ocean with uh, uh, the sea ice, you know, icebergs floating um, in this. And I'm going to put that up uh, beside the other one, because up on the shelf here, the other bit of kit that you need uh, for this, and some of you will recognize this from the Opto Electronics College kits that uh, you might have got with the solar buggies. What I've got is a lamp. Um, and again, something that may be worth considering uh, with the move to LED lamps, that if you can find, or if you do have some tungsten filament lamps or even halogen lamps, um, you know, look after them, keep them for purposes like this, because um, there are occasions when it's really handy to have uh, a heat lamp. So that um, 
you'll just take my need to take my word from it because I don't want to juggle too much around and spill ice. What I'm going to do now is just to set the lamp next to the two containers with the sea ice and the glacial ice. Um, put the lamp equidistant away from the two containers and we're just going to leave it there for a few minutes. We'll come back to this uh, later in the session. Uh, I'm setting this one up as the first demo because um, it's the one that takes longest. And um, that means that uh, we can then leave it while we're doing other things and come back and look at what's happened. But before we come back and look at what's happened, what I would like you to do is to make a prediction. Uh, you've seen how they've been set up. Um, hopefully the heat lamp is going to melt the ice in the two containers. So I would like you to predict what effect that that has on the sea level within the two containers. So I'll just give you uh, a minute or so to do that. Now, I would hope that since this is an uh, predict, explain, observe, explain, or observe, apply, as it's sometimes referred to activity, that if you're making a prediction that you can actually explain why that's the case. If you're suggesting that the sea level goes up or if it stays the same, or you know, some of you might predict that it goes down. Um, but you know, we've basically got three options um, that, um, that you have got some explanation for that, and it's not just a, a one in three guess. OK. Yeah, we'll just st stick with the uh, camera just now, um, Gregor, I think, because I'll just go on and, and do the next one, because um, the next activity that I would like to introduce uses a, another uh, plastic bottle. Here I've got a 500 milliliter uh, water bottle. Um, and what I've done is drilled uh, a hole in the cap and then put, in this case, a, a transparent plastic straw. Uh, again, something that's probably going to get more and more difficult to find these days. Um, but uh, a good suggestion that I think it was actually Alan that suggested this when he started doing the workshop as well, that uh, the inside, you know, the transparent inside of a uh, an old uh, Bic or Biro pen um, would do this job equally as well. Uh, so it's just pushed through into the bottle. Uh, and you can see that I've used a little bit of uh, hot glue just to seal around the top so that when the cap goes on, it is a tight seal that there's not going to be um, um, any way that anything could uh, escape or enter um, other than actually through the, the top of the tube. And what I did this morning is um, set one of these up and filled it up with water with a little bit of food colouring in it, just to try and make it a little bit uh, easier for you to see on screen. And there was actually quite an interesting thing. I set it up this morning because when the water comes out of the tap, um, you know, it's usually colder than ambient temperature. And um, I wanted it to reach um, a steady temperature, room temperature, for doing the session this afternoon. Um, and what actually happened, that there's obviously a cold front, but it's got um, quite cloudy. It was bright and sunny this morning. Um, and there's obviously a, a cold front going through um, with quite a lot of cloud. Um, and in actual fact, as I, I would hope as physics teachers would know, what happened was that the water contracted uh, and disappeared down um, into the bottle. So you couldn't see the level of the water anymore. Um, so I had to top it up. So the, the, the bit of water in here is um, probably not as red as the, the stuff with the food coloring because I just uh, put a little bit of water in the top. But using the bottle like this, what I'm going to do is to use uh, another bit of masking tape. And obviously, having had the little discussion about my uh, 
uh, difficulties this morning. You know, I've kind of given away the answer, but uh, I don't think this one is a, a, a showstopper. Uh, I'm going to put a little bit of masking tape around about the top, um, just where the, the, the level of the water. Now, be very careful when you've got a bottle like this, because, uh, you know, these days the, the walls of these plastic bottles seem to be getting thinner and thinner. So it's very easy when you pick it up to actually squeeze the bottle. And I hope that you can see there, you know, that as I squeeze it very gently, the, the, the water level is rising up. So it's possible if you, you squeeze it too hard to actually scoop some water out the top um, and obviously spoil the experiment. Um, if you hold it up around the neck, um, then hopefully that that's, um, you know, going to uh, not change in any way. And what I'm going to do is I've got a second uh, heat lamp plugged in uh, down here um, so that I'm going to do um, a second experiment and um, stick um, this bottle in front of the, the heat lamp. And uh, again, I would like you to do your predict and explain activity, um, given that I've given away at least half the answer. Um, for this one, or at least think about, you know, what are the sorts of things that the pupils are going to be able to say or predict about that? You know, what are you going to, um, uh, how are you going to respond to them? So I'll just give you a minute to uh, uh, write in what you, you think might be the case. Okay, so now that we're back to the um, presentation slide, um, essentially, um, you know, there's the, the slide that I missed out, just keeping it on uh, the camera mode, um, setting up the bottles. Again, it's um, one that you can actually set up a control if you wish, you know, without the lamp, uh, just so that you can convince the kids that uh, it hasn't just expanded because of some other effect that it is actually due to the, the heat lamp. Okay, so I can see that we've got some um, predictions here about it rising up the straw, for example. Thermal expansion will increase its volume. Yeah, obviously, you know, that's um, one I think that's less for us is less contentious as teachers. Okay, um, now on to the next one. Uh, here's the, the slide. And um, what we have got um, is a prediction what's going to happen when we take uh, an air-filled balloon and hold it above a candle. Again, predict and explain what's going to happen and why do you think that that's the case? And also, what happens if we do it with a water-filled balloon, or at least uh, a balloon with some water in, in the bottom, not completely filled? Um, just as you're thinking about what's going to happen with the two balloons, I can just say that um, about half of the ice in the, the first two containers that I showed you um, has melted now. So uh, we're, we're doing fine with that one. Well, I can see that we're getting some prediction, Greg's predicted that we're going to uh, get the, the 
air-filled balloon uh, is going to expand uh, and pop, whereas the water-filled balloon won't pop, for example. Uh, I haven't been watching everything that's been coming through. Uh, Alan, are there things that you would like to um, uh, summarise or add in at this moment? Uh, no, I think everybody's pretty much on the right track, as you would expect from a lot of physics teachers. Um, yeah. Just with the balloon thing, uh, possibly worth uh, mentioning, it's a good time to talk about fair testing, isn't it? And um, I generally deliberately make the two balloons a different colour in the hope that somebody will pick me up on it. Yeah, well, I, I've, I've, I've got mine that are both blue today, so with what I've got available. So just to show you, uh, there's the, the water-filled one. And um, there we have got, you know, in terms of fair testing, um, an air-filled one. Yeah. And uh, I've tried to make them as, as identical as possible. So again, you know, is a, a, an issue about um, fair testing and control, et cetera, as well. However, I'll keep them um, safely in their tray at the moment. Um, and uh, what we'll do is go on to the, the next um, experiment. And when I saw this, um, I must admit it was one of these absolute genius moments that, um, you know, I think have very few times in my career um, you know, so I just seen something and just thought that, you know, why, why didn't I think about that? And, um, you know, this is a, a much better way of approaching the topic. Um, and that is um, to do with um, different colours and absorption. Uh, because here I have got uh, two gloves. Um, and just for your interest, I've got another pair that's actually uh, exactly the same as this, but the hands are the other way around, um, so that, um, you know, that's an added bonus. Uh, but I've managed to get two sets of gloves, and it was actually quite difficult to get two sets of gloves that were, you know, fairly similar. Here, here they're sort of woolly gloves. Um, it was actually after seeing this, it was Jenny Hargreaves that came up, I think, with um, a, 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 an easy cut price solution to this, is rather than using gloves, because, you know, getting black and white gloves can be quite difficult is that it's really easy to get white sports socks and like black dress socks so you know it's sort of, uh, easy to get you know sort of men's black socks and white um, sports socks you know for a pack of five or a fiver or whatever like that and provided when you put them on you put the socks on fairly um, fairly snug and make sure that they are um, tight across the skin then that actually works quite well. But with the gloves, um, then you know you can put them on, and what you have got is your two hands, and basically one as a, a black surface sensor and one as a white surface sensor. And the way that I would do this with a, a, a class or with, you know with a, in a face-to-face -face workshop is that I would get a volunteer to come up, and I would ask them to to turn around, you know, come up to the front so that they're facing the, the class get them to turn around and then put their two arms behind their back um, so that they, they can't see their hands. And then in full view of everybody else, I would then put the glove on uh, one on each hand uh, so that they don't know which glove is on which hand. And then all you need to do is to take your heat lamp, you know, that I've been using here and again, place it fairly, um, you know, equidistant away. It's good if, if you've got them standing with their hands behind their back, you know, just to hold the hands, uh, you know, like this so that they're next to each other, you know, or something um, at, just in the small of their back, for example, so that they can't see what's going on. And then just hold the heat lamp up, um, you know, close to the, the, the two hands, you know, something like this so that you're getting a, um, a sort of even heating on, on both hands. And it's literally within oh, 15, 20 seconds. Um, if you say, you know, when you can detect a difference between the two hands, can you hold up which one is hotter? And I, it has never failed that the person just puts within seconds, holds up the black hand that, um, um, that it's absorbed the, the heat energy uh, significantly more quickly. I, I think, Alan, I think you've maybe had a, um, a little issue with with 
that. I think it possibly depends on the type of glove and uh, how well fitting there are. But I, I know that you had said that you had had a problem, but had come up with a solution. Uh, perhaps I haven't been as bold with how close I hold my heating element to the hands of strangers. And possibly also I used um, latex examination gloves. I got a box of white 100, box of black 100, but not very much. But strangely, they seem to be sold out on Amazon at the moment. I'm not sure why. Um, but yeah, they, uh, if, if you do have people who have circulation problems and can't detect the difference in temperature between the two gloves, if you get them to hold the hands up to their face afterwards, then it is quite striking that one hand is much hotter than the other. Okay, thanks. So um, there we have got um, the, the um, uh, sort of glove um, example. Um, so um, that takes us on to um, the next little bit. So if uh, Gregor, if you could um, put us back onto the slides. OK, uh, predicting how this will feel, um, which we, we've covered. Um, the next part of the presentation, if I was normally doing this face to face, um, would be to, to show the video. Now, I think that um, I'm, I'm sort of confident that this was uh, sent out to um, with the sort of joining instructions to suggest that you watch this. Um, this video and there are two versions essentially the, the core part of the activity, which if you haven't watched it, is essentially um, taking a, a heat mat, the sort of thing that you might use in a, a propagator in a greenhouse to warm seedlings, uh, where you put seed trays on the top. But there they, they cover it with a, a, a towel. Um, and what they then do is hold different containers of different gases, uh, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and methane. Uh, where they've taken um, like perspex tubes, um, made cylinder cylindrical containers, uh, maybe something like about uh, 10 or 15 centimeters long, and then covered the ends with cling film because um, you need something that is transparent or reasonably transparent to infrared. And if you hold the containers across the top of the heat mat, and then take an infrared camera. And um, I know that CERC has circulated a, a, an infrared camera uh, to all local authorities. So that, um, all of you should be able to access um, an infrared camera to do this reasonably easily. But I must also say that the, the FLIR or FLIR um, adapters that you get for iPhones and iPads these days are, are actually relatively cheap for um, what they actually do, you know, there's still maybe a couple of hundred pounds or so on, uh, but um, they're a really good way of uh, getting a, a good um, infrared uh, camera um, and with a, a good display screen on it as well. And obviously, if you have got a way of then sharing the files, um, then uh, using the, the, an iPad or an iPhone uh, to do that. And I think you get them for uh, Android devices as well. Um, if you take an infrared camera, as they've done in the video here, and then you can actually have a look at the absorption of the different gases. And the, the, the video dramatically uh, shows the impact that um, methane has in absorbing the um, uh, infrared radiation. Um, the, the actual tube, when you look at, you know, try to look through it um, towards the heat mat with the infrared camera, is actually quite dark, quite cool. Uh, because the infrared has been absorbed. So it does show that the much greater impact that um, infrared, um, the absorption of infrared brought by uh, methane and carbon dioxide, and, you know, the, the two uh, strongest um, greenhouse gases that we have in the, in the atmosphere. And um, obviously there are issues with uh, there being quite large quantities of methane uh, actually in um, uh, under tundra and, and other areas around the world. Um, Alan, are there things that are coming up in the, the chat box? I see that there's a few things coming uh, there that um, I, I've missed or we could add in about some of the discussion around about the absorption of gases. 
Uh, yeah, J James at our Ladies College was just asking, and I think had asked the question initially about, oh, yes. um, uh, about the tr what exactly they mean by transparent to infrared light and why, I think there was a question at the start about why some greenhouse gases are considered to be, in inverted commas, more damaging than others. Um, well, not, not being a particularly uh, up-to-date chemist or uh, something that I've looked at, obviously that there are, um, you know, why um, different gases absorb at different rates are to do with the, uh, the bonds and the, the, the molecules. Um, but again, I, I'm no expert on that uh, whatsoever. Um, in terms of transparent, you know, nitrogen and oxygen um, are transparent in that the infrared radiation will pass through uh, without being absorbed, um, whereas the carbon dioxide uh, infrared radiation incident on a higher concentration of carbon dioxide will be absorbed. Um, so therefore, the carbon dioxide is is not transparent to um, the infrared radiation. And again, that's what you can see on the video where the um, when you hold the the oxygen and nitrogen above the heat mat, there's basically no change compared to the normal situation, which you, you know, hopefully would would expect. And that the the normal situation has air, uh, you know, being a, a basically a mixture of mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. Uh, so holding the pure um, nitrogen or oxygen container basically has very little difference um, to the amount of the absorption. And therefore, the the coloration of the infrared film um, remains quite bright, in that there is quite a lot of infrared radiation being transmitted through the tube to the camera. But when you then hold the carbon dioxide tube, because it's absorbing the infrared, uh, the infrared isn't reaching the camera, and um, the the actual tube looks correspondingly cooler, um, and uh, basically because the infrared has been absorbed. Um, I don't know if that answers the, the question sufficiently. Yeah, I think so. Um, David had also asked about explaining to BGE students about why a black surface absorbs or emits energy more than a white surface. And this is almost similar in a way to that last question in that really when we get right down to it, we're into quantum effects here yeah. and the science is actually quite complex uh, as, as part of a reason why a, this is a difficult topic to explain, and B, this perimeter stuff is so fantastic because it, it presents it in simple. Yeah, I think it's the sort of thing that you're always going to get this Akeem kid that um, is going to ask these awkward questions um, that you won't necessarily have the answer to. You know, I think it's a good opportunity to say, you know, that's a really good question. You know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, that's worth researching. Um, you know, get a little bit of homework for them to go away and, and um, have a look at. Um, again, it's the sort of thing that, you know, we, I think when you're designing a lesson, designing a topic like that, this, there are a few key ideas that you want to get over. And, you know, as I say, using the gloves um, is a really quick and easy way to show the relative absorption of the, the black and white surfaces. Uh, as I say, it takes literally seconds. Um, so, you know, that, that is a way of actually you know, potentially freeing up time that you might have done, you know, for many times in my career, I've, you know, had kids spending a, a an hour, you know, or half an hour at least, you know, with different colored flasks, with, um, you know, thermometers and um, looking at um, both emission and absorption um, of infrared, looking at the effects of the different colors. Um, you know, perhaps this is a way of, of getting to the the core learning relatively quickly to allow us to ex explore some of uh, the other topics and get into you know some of the debate about the implications in terms of of uh, climate change rather than just um, spending a lot of time you know looking at, at, at different coloured flasks. Um, it, it depends obviously on what you want to do within the lesson. If if one of the things is to collect real data that the kids can then graph to practice their graph drawing skills, for example, you know, that's a, uh, would be another, you know, reason to, uh, you know, perhaps do it the other way. But, uh, you know, as, as I said, when I, when I first saw the um, black and white um, gloves experiment, I, I just thought it was one of these sort of genius ideas. Uh, anything else, Alan? 
Yeah, just just um, James was asking again about how many times worse uh, methane is compared to car carbon dioxide. I mean, I'm, again, I'm no expert on it. I put the figure in there. It's often bandied around it's about 20 times worse. Uh, Rachel has pointed out that it's probably not that simple and it will depend upon the time scale considered, but certainly much more effective yeah. than carbon. Yeah. Yeah, no, I can't shed in any more uh, uh, detailed um, explanation uh, with that. But again, that's the, the sort of thing that I think it would be probably relatively easy to, to find online. OK, so if if we go on, um, you know, in terms of setting up these experiments, uh, you know, we've had a little chat about two of them. We'll come back to the, the um, containers with water in a moment, you know, in terms of how that actually um, relates to the earth, um, I would hope that everybody here is familiar with the the, the standard sort of greenhouse uh, effect explanation about the you know absorption of the um, radiation from the sun, uh, raising the temperature of the ground, warming the atmosphere, um, and um, um, the the uh, emitted. Uh, radiation obviously from the from the earth surface at about 300 k um, is obviously a much longer wavelength than the radiation from the the sun at about 6000 k uh, and therefore the um, absorption in the atmosphere um, so again that, that allows you to have a little bit of i think discussion with the kids uh, about exactly what the greenhouse effect is and what's actually going on in the atmosphere with the gases i think one of the, the common misconceptions that you often come across at this point is there's a lot of confusion about um, what's going on in the ozone layer and about the hole, uh, hole in the ozone um, and about the effect of CFCs etc. Um, so just making sure that it's clear that um, that's a, a different um, effect altogether, different concept at this point uh, because again from experience lots of kids get these two things confused. Um, so in terms of the concentration of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, one of the key bits of data and graphs that um, I think it's really important for everybody to know about in terms of climate change is what's referred to as the Keeling curve. And it's a measurement of the concentration of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere you know, over a period of time. And uh, for the last uh, 60 years or so, there have been continuous measurements at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. And I've just got a little question before we actually, for you to think about, um, before we go on, is why the sort of baseline world measurement of what is happening to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is measured on Mauna Loa of all places. See if you can in the chat box give a reason for where why that's the the standard measurement station. Yeah, Mauna Loa is in Hawaii. And we're getting quite a, a number of different uh, reasons there. And essentially, there's a, a grain of truth in, in, in several, if not most, most of them. But essentially, you know, Hawaii is stuck right bang in the, the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's the, the point on the earth um, that is basically furthest away from um, large scale industrial areas. Um, it means that the air in Hawaii is essentially the, the best mixed, um, least locally affected air on any sort of landmass anywhere around about the, the world. Um, 
one of the the things that sometimes gets uh, put up as you know one of the the reasons given for this is all just a, a hoax is that many of the the world's weather stations uh, are at airports because you know meteorological offices are often based at airports and uh, I think there's a very good reason to say that uh, you know taking weather measurements at uh, an airport you know or somewhere like Heathrow you know is not necessarily going to be representative of the air uh, quality the air mix um, across the whole world but we can be very sure that the sort of mix of air that you get in Hawaii is actually going to be uh, representative of what the general mix of air around about the globe is actually like and that it's not going to be down to uh, local changes like you know having lots of jet aircraft uh, taken off right next to it. Um, so since 1958, they've been taking measurements. Now, this isn't an up-to-date measurement. Um, again, I'm sure Alan will post um, links to the actual website where you can get the actual up-to-date today's measurement. I went on last night and had a look. Um, and basically, um, on the 31st of May, it's actually sitting at about 417 parts per million for the concentration of carbon dioxide. So. In the last year, uh, just from the numerical change, there's been certainly a change of two and a half to three parts per million. Um, but if you had a look at that graph, and you can see that the, the sort of grey dots are the, the hourly average, and there is a measurement for most hours. They, they do have periods where there, there isn't a measurement. Um, and you can see that there is a kind of daily cycle, that there's these spikes. Um, but then you've got this sort of middle-sized um, sort of slightly bigger black dot is the, the daily average and then uh, a weekly average with the, the bigger black dot. And, and there's a little bit of variation there, but you know, it looks reasonably stable. Um, actually, um, I've stuck with the um, date for um, June last year for a reason. Uh, again, the first time I actually presented this workshop um, was last summer and um, um, I use the, the dates, but I think it is actually, uh, in many ways, the best part of the year to take as your baseline, because it allows you to ask questions to see people's understanding about this. Because here we have got the monthly figure, um, but there we can take the figure for six months. And if you zoom out and, you know, you've got your six months running up, um, you know, basically from around about Christmas time up to June. Um, then things start to look a little bit more alarming that we definitely seem like we've got an increase there and again that that's you know one of the things that you've got to be careful with and that i mentioned back at the beginning about where you take your baselines and how you can select data because if we then actually look for a year things look slightly different that it would appear that there has been a decrease and i would like to ask you this point in time, if you can make a prediction um, or an explanation, I should say, that explains what's going on on this apparently annual cycle of carbon dioxide levels. So again, give you a minute or so to have a think and to stick something in the chat box. Okay, so I'm I'm seeing uh, immediately the those of you that are quick out of the 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 blocks. Uh, Mark's done it in one word, but you know we need uh, maybe a little bit more explanation. And we've got um, Lawrence has given a little bit more explanation about the northern hemisphere. Yeah, this this is obviously to do with photosynthesis. Um, and to look a little bit more deeply into this, you need to think about where the land mass is, um, uh, how it's spread across. The globe and most of the world's land mass is in the northern hemisphere. So while there's lots said about you know the Amazon being the, the lungs of the world, 
Um, you know, and obviously, you know, cutting down uh, big chunks of the Amazon and so on is certainly not something that I'm recommending um, in any in any ways. Uh, but um, in actual fact, it's the uh, arboreal um, forest in the northern hemisphere. You know, places like Scotland, but all the um, um, you know forests across Scandinavia, uh, through Russia, etc. Um, the large forests in North America. Um, that they have a, a more dominating factor on the carbon dioxide levels across the globe um, rather than um, in the southern hemisphere because there is just less landmass. Uh, there is obviously photosynthesis also going on in the oceans as well, and um, the um, um, photosynthesis in the ocean is a significant uh, contributor to this. Um, but essentially, you know, it's useful to highlight here that you know the, the carbon dioxide does actually change on an annual cycle. Um, and it is because of photosynthesis and plant growth uh, in the summer months. Um, and then obviously the leaf drop and um, the um, return of, of carbon dioxide uh, to the atmosphere in the winter. But because of the relative distribution of the land mass, that that is actually Northern Hemisphere dominated. And if we zoom out a little bit further, we can actually see that we have got these annual cycles. Um, you know, so going back uh, now, you know, since um, the um, start of measurements in 1958, you'll see that we do, ha do have these annual cycles. However, that there is a clear underlying trend um, and that uh, although we've been using the um, Mona Lau uh, data, very accurate data from um, the um, measurements in, in Hawaii since 1958, that period overlaps significantly with ice core data that have been taken from uh, places like Greenland and Antarctica and so on. So that there is a good correlation and calibration between the modern measurement data and much older data that can be obtained by looking at some of the very ancient ice cores uh, that we have got access to. And um, this is the classic cooling curve, what's often referred to as the hockey stick curve. And you know, you, uh, I can't really um, go through a Perimeter Institute, you know, Canadian presentation without in, uh, including mention of a hockey stick somewhere. Uh, I think it's it's compulsory if you've got anything to do with Canada uh, to um, talk about ice hockey at, at one point. And uh, so this is the, the the point for this presentation, I think. And what we have got here is the uh, classic uh, cooling curve with the uh, hockey stick shape. Um, but we can keep on going back back further. And if we actually um, look at um, the sort of older data, you can see that there are natural cycles going on here that uh, I think it's fairly, most people are reasonably convinced that there is something going on at a roughly 100,000 year cycle. Um, and that um, you know we've had a peak there about 400,000 years ago and another one around about 300,000 years ago. And as we come up, um, that would mean that it would suggest that we're probably at a peak. But if you actually have a look, it's not the actual axis of the graph, it's the actual data on the graph. You can see that where we are now at about 417 parts per million, um, that the evidence that the levels of carbon dioxide that we've now got in our atmosphere um, are not the sorts of levels that are consistent with the historical data um, and not consistent with these sort of fluctuations that we can see on this approximately 100,000 year um, cycle that we, we've got in this graph, that we have just basically gone off the scale. And that has essentially happened um, you know, since the Industrial Revolution and particularly in the last uh, 50 or 60 years. So again, one of the messages that, um, as we've discussed earlier, needs to be handled quite carefully in terms of uh, not um, um, you know, taking away hope um, for, for the, the, the future of uh, our young people. Okay, I've covered the observe and explain, you know, when I put on the gloves, uh, rather than coming back to that, we've already, um, you know, covered the experiment. Um, that the uh, black one obviously absorbs. What does this actually, um, how does that impact on the earth? Well, it's basically to do 
um, with the reflectivity, particularly from the uh, ice caps and from glaciers. Um, that if we've got uh, a lower albedo, uh, the albedo being the reflectivity of the, the uh, a planetary surface, um, that means that there's less reflection and more absorption. So we've actually got a, a positive feedback cycle uh, potentially here. And again, one of the um, animations, which is really good, and it can run through and it goes through month by month, um, is one where you can trace the amount of Arctic sea ice. So here I've got the, um, the ice cap cover for the Arctic Ocean uh, in September uh, 1984, so end of the summer of 1984. So it's kind of at the lowest level um, for that particular year. Uh, and the color used in the diagram is important. You'll notice that the ice across the North Pole is shaded through different shades of grey to white and the white is the older sea ice, ice that has remained unmelted for four or five years or more. Um, so that uh, it's important when if you play through this animation that you actually pay attention not just to the actual surface area coverage of the ice but essentially the quality of the ice um, by looking at its age. So again, there is an animation that runs through this. It is hidden in the PowerPoint, as I said before. All I'm going to do is to jump through to September uh, 2019. And uh, again, uh, you know, potentially one of these scary um, uh, moments for introducing this to kids, um, that the total coverage of Arctic sea ice has decreased quite significantly. But most importantly, the actual quality of that ice, the age of that ice has decreased markedly. Um, you can understand now why it is that um, shipping companies are now seriously looking at um, shipping freight from um, China on the, you know, the um, top left corner of the, the globe here up through the Bering Strait and around the northern coast of uh, Russia um, across towards Svalberg um, and to Europe um, in the, that obviously crossing is much, much shorter than um, going down uh, through the traditional routes uh, through the Indian Ocean and whether it's through Suez or around the Cape, um, obviously at a much greater distance. So, um, you know, shipping com companies are seriously looking at um, um, actually being able to um, transport freight um, across the, the Arctic in the not too distant future. OK, so that takes um, us back on to the um, actual observe and explain part. I've set up the sort of three experiments that we have got left. Having talked about the uh, video of the uh, cylinders of gas and the, the gloves. So what I'm going to have a go at now, um, and um, I'm going to try and do this carefully. So if uh, Gregor, if we can go back onto the camera again. Um, I've got a, a grapnel tray in front of me, and um, I have got um, um, a tea light in here and uh, a match. Okay, so I've now um, lit uh, the candle, the tea light. I'll just uh, lift it up so you can see. Um, I, I am going to do this on uh, in a tray. Um, I'm hoping that we don't have any disasters, but uh, if we do, I don't want um, a water balloon all over the computer. I think it might um, um, bring the session to a premature end. So um, I'm going to um, hold the, the tray like this. You from, you know, you're not going to be able to see the candle, um, but what I'm going to do is to heat up the balloon. Now, there were some predictions before about what's going to happen to the balloon. Would anybody like to rethink their prediction? I can't see anybody typing, so I'm just going to heat the balloon above the candle. Oh, that didn't work. I, I put it down too low and put the candle out. It's all, all one of these live demonstrations. So I think uh, Tim, when he did the um, 
balloon experiment um, on the virtual physics staff room um, a few days ago, uh, a few weeks ago, obviously had issues with his balloon. So it seems like that um, it's catching. So um, I'll have another go at this. OK, so got the, the candle and I'm just going to hold the balloon and let's see what happens when. We... Right. OK, um, that was fairly um, dramatic and um, it's the, the actual um, air coming out of the balloon has blown out the candle. So I need to have another go at lighting it for the next one. OK, now you notice that that, that was a very rapid change that um, we actually had there. Um, the balloon really didn't change, it just popped. Um, so what I've now got is the um, water balloon, and I'm going to just do the same thing. I'm going to hold the um, water balloon above the candle in the tray, uh, just the same as before. And you can certainly see that there isn't any sort of rapid change as um, we had before. And um, I've certainly done this for quite a significant length of time without any problem. Um, when I did this in Canada last year, one of the um, IOP physics coaches from down in the London area was actually across uh, at the same time. And, and he insisted that we didn't do this with a tray that um, actually did it above his head. And um, he was sufficiently confident that uh, it wasn't going to burst, that um, we did it above his head and indeed it didn't burst. Um, would anybody like to now uh, write up in the chat box what you think is going on? Why is it that the water balloon didn't burst and the air balloon basically burst immediately? Okay, Gregor, if we can go back to the slides just for one or two more slides, and then we'll come back to the camera for the, the next demos too. Yeah, and I'm seeing now a, a couple of uh, answers coming up and the, 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 the magic words as far as a I think that the physics concept is concerned in that specific heat capacity. Uh, essentially, what we've got between the, the difference between the water and the air is the specific heat capacity of the, the two materials, that the water can absorb much more energy uh, with very little temperature rise. Um, the, the actual conduction through the, the rubber of the balloon is sufficiently good that the um, energy to can get to the water and that the water is essentially a, a huge heat soak. Um, and that, that um, prevents the, the, the latex from actually um, reaching a high enough temperature to melt, to burst. Whereas with the um, air-filled balloon, there isn't the ability to absorb the energy and the, the latex temperature just rises and bursts immediately. Um, it's not to do with the gas inside heating up and expanding. Uh, if you think about the actual temperature change that would be required um, for the balloon to expand, to burst, you know, I didn't blow these balloons up very high. You know, we would need to get an increase in volume um, of maybe four or five times before the balloon would burst. And uh, if you know your gas laws and do the simple arithmetic, we're not getting a temperature change um, to cause the gas to expand to burst the balloon. It's a, a specific heat capacity uh, difference which is causing um, the, the, uh, the difference between the two scenarios. And 70% um, of the Earth is covered by water. There's lots of heat energy absorbed in the water. There's a huge heat soak there. Um, and um, you know the oceans are getting hotter. Again, we've got various measurements for that. And um, back to the observe and explain. I think we can just do this one um, quickly. Um, yeah, just in front of the camera. It's actually not that significant. It's only gone up about six 
or seven millimeters, but it's gone up just a little bit. Um, so we've got a little bit of expansion. I think in actual fact, um, it, the problem with that one is I haven't really had the lamp uh, lined up on the um, the um, actual bottle well enough to make a difference. Now, if we go back to uh, our other demonstration, just while we've we've got the, um, the uh, Gregor's gone back to the um, slides, but I was just going to do this one since we've got it. There is the container with the sea ice. It's basically had no change. Um, the relative density of the um, you know water at different temperatures and so on is negligible. If you're um, you know thinking about that, essentially because of Archimedes' principle and the you know displacing the the mass of water um, means that when the ice melts. Um, basically the level doesn't change. So a point to make to the kids, the icebergs melting or the uh, ice sheets off um, the Antarctic and so on, when they melt, uh, they're not going to have any significant effect on sea level rise. However, when you get to glacial ice, like um, Greenland, for example, then you've actually got a significant difference. If you notice, there's the actual line where we had before. And this has now gone up about oh, at least uh, 12, 15 millimetres uh, in this container uh, as the ice cubes have melt, melted. And in actual fact, our continent is completely submerged um, because um, the uh, ice cubes have melted. The runoff from on top of the land has run off into the oceans and raised um, the level. So quite a significant change there. So if we can go back to um, the slides, please, Gregor. I'm just conscious of the time is uh, running away with us. So a um, couple of exper experiments of observe and explain. Um, actually measuring the ocean's volume, we've got very good data from this. Um, Argo, which is the, I'll just get my little notes, one of the ones that I always have trouble remembering, Advanced Research and Global Observation Satellite. And it um, has, there are lots of buoys around about the globe which go on this sort of uh, cycle over a number of days where they uh, dip down to uh, below the surface, take measurements of things like the salinity, the temperature of the um, seawater, and then pop up to the surface, then communicate with the satellites. And when I first saw the next slide, um, you know, it took my breath away a little bit and it's almost one of these slides that gets a bit of an ah when people see it, because this isn't just a small data set. Um, as I say, in November 2018, um, there were nearly 4,000 of these devices across the oceans. So it's not just, um, you know, you might think in the old days, um, you know, we had these um, wooden poles beside um, uh, rivers and on beaches and things measuring the, the levels. Um, here we've got actually quite a sophisticated measurement device and it's giving us global sea level uh, uh, levels with um, measurements from all of these devices. So um, just skipping through this quickly, we've discussed a little bit about the um, land difference between land and sea ice. Um, so again, something I think quite important to um, just make clear to the kids. And uh, GRACE, one of the, the other uh, satellites, it's the uh, Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment um, satellite. It's measuring the actual uh, land ice mass. And the main two land ice masses, of course, are Antarctica and on Greenland. And the uh, ice mass is decreasing at 127 gigatons per year on Antarctica. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but, you know, um, a gigaton isn't something that I can particularly uh, visualize. I don't think the kids can visualize it. But essentially, what the GRACE measurements are showing is that we're losing about 400 gigatons per year. And the modeling that we've actually got about the, the sea level budget um, from both the expansion, what we've seen with the, the bottle with the um, food coloring in it, and the actual um, sea level due to the, the glacial melt, uh, when you add them together from the models that we've now been running for you know some considerable years now, the 
modeling results is the purple line on this graph and it almost exactly matches the black line the actual real measurements of sea level so that we are very confident that the models that the scientists are running are actually um, predicting and um, giving results that actually are um, very very accurate so um, before we try and put a little bit of a positive spin on this to end what are the effects of climate change well obviously increased flooding more extreme weather events um, obviously the, the wildfires that um, uh, we had in Australia um, last year were you know the most extreme that had been seen for, for a very long time for example um, the thaw thawing permafrost um, lots of areas in like northern Canada and Siberia and so on where the the infrastructure is basically being built on permafrost on the, the basis that it's always going to be there uh, that it is perma um, and not proving to be the case and of, also the potential for releasing quite a lot of trapped carbon up um, methane I should say and um, obviously issues around um, spreading disease um, because of the uh, change in temperature you know uh, are we going to get uh, mosquitoes and malaria um, in, in Scotland um, I think the, the people like uh, Mark over on the west coast at the moment uh, will no doubt be looking forward to the midgy season uh, I think they're bad enough without us getting uh, ones that basically transmit lots of disease as well um, but also uh, another effect that I wasn't really quite as aware of until I attended a, a lecture at um, our dynamic earth in Edinburgh back in last autumn um, where it was Professor Dieter Helm from from Oxford was talking about the actual effect on um, potential ex extinctions with climate change um, you know insects can obviously move around quite readily but if they rely on uh, certain types of tree for example you know forests can't move north um, if it gets warmer um, at a particularly fast rate it takes you know perhaps decades to regenerate so there are significant issues around about um, potential extinction because of the dislocation of um, certain species away from uh, others in a, the food chain for example um, so I'd like to just round off by saying climate change is real it is us it is down to humans it is serious um, a very good uh, source of information on this is a, a Canadian climate scientist who's based in Texas called uh, Catherine Hayhoe and um, there are a number of uh, websites that um, provide very good information include the, including the project drawdown one I think Alan that, um, I think you were maybe wanting just to say very briefly a few words on this before we, we finish off yeah, I think it's really important, as Stuart said earlier, not to end on a on a doom and gloom note. And you know, we're short of time here today, but Drawdown has got ranked by how effective they think they're likely to be. A hundred things that people can actually do, and some of those are large, sort of governmental policy policy decisions. But a lot of those are things that you and I can actually do, and that's I think worth definitely spending some time yeah. with the students on. I mean, um, you know, things which sound like they might be a brilliant idea, like running electric cars, are actually at number 75 on the list. But eating a plant-rich diet, as we can see there now, is, is, is right up near number four, you know. So there, there are lots of actions that individuals can actually take to make. Yeah, so the, these are the, the top 10. Um, I think most of them are, I think, fairly obvious to most people. I think number six is an interesting one. Um, obviously, educating girls. Um, can have a significant effect on a whole range of um, a positive effect on a whole range of things and as you can see that that includes climate change um, uh, silvo pasture if you're it's maybe one that you're not so aware of that's basically um, mixed grazing where you um, mix animals in with um, um, the growing trees and like orchards and things like that that um, um, has a, a very significant uh, positive effect um, I skipped over one slide there and it was really about trying to put some of the, the positive actions. Um, I mentioned before about the confusion that lots of kids have about the ozone layer and CFCs. That's actually um, can be used in a positive way that since basically the, the world agreed to address the issues of CFCs, um, 
then the, the issue of the deletion of the ozo layer um, has actually been improving. It is recovering. Um, so it shows that where there can be global agreement on um, positive actions, that can actually resolve a lot of the problems. Um, there are other things that are being done, um, you know, like the um, World Bank not funding fossil fuel exploration and so on any, anymore. Uh, so there are there are a, a number of positive things that can be used, but it does basically come back to you know addressing the the key things listed there by uh, Project Drawdown. Um, some people in Scotland get slightly surprised by number one. Um, in large parts of the world, uh, it's not keeping warm that's important; it's actually keeping cool. And there's a huge amount of the world's energy resources goes on refrigeration, whether that be air conditioning buildings or you know refrigeration for for food and, and other things. Um, so that's one that's maybe um, surprising to those of us used to the climate in Scotland. Um, but you know, it is possible to take action. And one of the key things that the perimeter would be advocating is that we actually just talk about this. We raise this with the kids. We address the issue that Alan made at the beginning is don't let the kids get to the point where they've fallen for the conspiracy theories and the, the fake news, the bad science, um, because once they get beyond a certain point with that, it's really difficult to get them back. So if we can um, use some very simple science, as you've seen here today, you know, it's simple things like, um, you know, absorption of different colors, it's, you know, expansion and contraction, um, you know, state change, uh, specific heat capacity, they're all relatively simple physics concepts but we have, if we back that up with the information and the, the data that we can get from the, the various sources and the graphs, then I think we've got a very good um, chance of actually raising the, the general education level of uh, our young people and, and population as a whole, um, as well, of course, as the lobbying for systemic change. Um, I haven't mentioned Greta Thunberg yet, but I don't think we could go through a session like this without uh, obviously showing that when somebody does actually take practical action and raise the, the profile of activities, then um, it is possible to change the, the public mood about things quite significantly. So um, I'm very conscious that we've gone a little bit over, um, but I think that that would be a good point for us to uh, finish off for today. Um, I'm sure we can maybe get in one or two questions before the end, um, but, uh, Alan, is there anything else that you've um, seen as we've been going through that you think we ought to address? Well, I'm just looking at the list of questions that people asked at the start, and I think most of the sort of scientific ones have been addressed uh, during the course of the session. There are some, you know, bigger questions about how do we teach this without freaking the children out. Um, Liz asked the excellent question: Should we stop calling it climate change and start calling it a climate emergency? Um, uh, and there were also some questions about can we undo the damage that's already been done uh, and I guess these are quite big questions for the yeah. human race. I, th I think they're big questions for a human race but you know it's one of these things that um, if we all individually think that it, oh, it's too big a problem and that our change is going to be negligible so it's not worth doing it then we aren't going to get the sort of level of change that's required it does need government change, but I think it needs individual change as well. Uh, and some of the things can be quite simple, as you say, change of diet, um, um, you know, change of some of the um, uh, simple farming practices, the um, you know, move to having more um, uh, PV cells for um, um, electricity generation and so on um, are likely to have significant effects both on a, an individual level as well as beyond. Okay, Gregor, are there things that you want to say about evaluation and things before we finish? Uh, just as before, you'll be sent out uh, uh, a link with a recording of this presentation, a uh, download of Stuart's PowerPoint, and a link to the evaluation of the session. 
Uh, the other thing I'd like to say, after of course thanking Stuart for a session that I think has had loads of great ideas for things to do in the classroom, is uh, just a wee teaser here. Keep your eye out on Sputnik and on Sex social media for uh, another couple of things that you can take part in to do with the virtual summer school. It's not all just online seminar type sessions, there's something completely different coming up that uh, I think many of you will be really keen to take part in.